thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Actually, I've been here in Manchester, I think, three years ago, two or three years ago. Um, so it's great to be back. We, at that time, we didn't have this nice place to speak in. Um, so here are my slides. They will be a bit squeezed right now, but I hope we can unsqueeze them from the back over there. So yeah, thanks for the great talks. Uh, Gemma, Jair, I think we have a lot of uh, touching points and, and, and points where we can discuss further. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction as well. Um, my name is Moritz Stefana. I, I do data visualization. There's quite a spectrum of things I do, so I might do very clean and analytic uh, designs and graphics for big organizations. Um, sometimes people commission me for high-end custom visualizations, and I also like to experiment a bit with data art and maybe pushing the envelope of what we can do with data and just experiment uh, what's possible. So one of these um, experimentations was also in connection with Future Everything, so we share some history. Uh, the Moto project from, uh, uh, that tried to capture the audience response for London 2012, like what the people online, how they experienced the games, how that maybe diverged or converged with traditional media coverage. And we analyzed the Twitter messages around the games for emotional content, again, just the English ones. Um, uh, but that was a limitation we were quite, quite aware of at the time as well. But it's a, one that is hard to overcome technically. And yeah, build online visualizations, a data sculpture, and so on. Um, I'm also working on a very totally secret and super work in progress um, thing, uh, again, with Future Everything about climate services. And we're looking at seasonal wind predictions. And it's quite a technical issue and one that has to do a lot with modeling uncertainty. And we try to make these things more accessible and uh, digestible uh, in order to deal better with climate change. Anyways, today I'll show you two projects from the realm of cultural analytics. So over the last year and a half, I've been cooperating with Lev Manovich, who is a um, famous media uh, researcher and media artist as well. Uh, and we're looking into how we can characterize complex cultural phenomena through data, like what is the data footprint and maybe the data portray of a complex cultural phenomenon. And that's something very interesting to investigate because you'd think culture and numbers don't go that well together, and many people think that. And uh, this tension is, of course, very exciting to explore. So the first project um, I want to look into, as I said, together with Lev Manovic, but also Daniel Godemeyer and Dominikus Bauer, we looked into what is a good digital representation of Broadway. It's a super famous street. It's a social place. Um, it actually spans, I only learned that while working on the project, it goes through the whole of Manhattan. So the Manhattan part of Broadway is 13 miles long. Uh, we often just think about Times Square when we hear Broadway or the musicals, but actually it goes through the whole of Manhattan from Financial District over Times Square, um, over to Harlem and Fort George and Invert. And we just set out to think about, okay, how can we characterize what's happening on the street, like all the differences, the diversity of the city, uh, the big picture patterns, how can we characterize that? And there have been interesting precedents. For instance, Ed Rusher's work, he, he did photographic experiments already in the 60s of how we can characterize these long strips in the street, how can we capture a full image of a street in a, um, in a photographic way. Of course, today we have um, Google Street View. So Ed Rusher actually had to travel the whole street and take photos and stitch them together. Now we can access APIs to pull uh, millions of images of a street, basically. And of course, as a first step, we were looking at, into how can we experiment with these images to sort of maybe spot patterns or learn something more about, about what that goes beyond what you would see when you just step into the street. And so we experimented quite a bit with different collage or montage arrangements of these images. Um, if you can sort of identify longer stretches of identical buildings or similar buildings along Broadway. Um, we started to mix maps with imagery. And so the, the, the photographic material becomes sort of uh, um, the, 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 the oil <laughs> you paint with, more or less. You use images as the image material for another image. Um, but of course, this only reflects the buildings, basically, <laughs> the, the asphalt and the, the concrete. Um, and the other side we can investigate today is really the, what happens on the street, right? So we were also looking into um, which images people take, like Instagram images, 
which messages they wrote at different places. So in a way, we were sort of exploiting all this metadata and all these contents that are being so um, um, uh, shared today, um, but now for artistic purposes and trying to characterize this street. And again, the challenge is how can we make sense of that? So we were looking at how can we, for instance, extract color palettes, maybe identify indoor versus outdoor images, nightlife versus shopping, things like this and try to create these color profiles along Broadway that would show you um, the distribution of colors along a certain stretch of, of Broadway. And again, in one way to spot patterns, but another way also to use the existing image material in a, in a remix thinking way uh, to create new artworks. The third part that goes into our project is of course the data layer, because what you see on the street is one thing, but there is all this sort of the invisible Broadway that is consecuted of all the data we have about the places, of all the social media posts people make. So we used income data. Uh, we used taxi drop-offs. So there's a big data set of all taxi rides 2013 in, the, in New York, but also social media data um, like Instagram images, Foursquare check-ins, and so on. And it's a bit hard to see over here, especially the the, the darker colors. <clears throat> but what's interesting is, on the one hand, of course, all the hotspots are at the, the places you would expect, like uh, Columbus Circle and Times Square and so on. But each of these different layers has its own profile. So you might sometimes have lots of Foursquare check-ins, but almost no Twitter messages, things like this. And the second thing we observed is that the social media inequality is much higher than the actual physical inequality. So you can see the taxi rides at the income there is quite a difference between the south part and the north part of the Broadway. In a way, there are two very distinct Broadways um, that you can talk about. But it's much more pronounced in the Instagram images and the four square check-ins and in, in the, the Twitter images. And we need to verify this a bit more, but there's good sort of evidence that the social media inequality or the digital divide might be even bigger than the actual, let's say, physical divide yeah. or what you can see on the street. This might, though, also be distorted by tourists, and this is the thing we have to figure out first. Um, anyway, so we looked at many different renderings of the data in our, in our creative process. All these different views play a big role to sort of gather as many impressions of an, an abstract phenomenon in order, so we shape our understanding of it and then can produce the final piece. So we looked at different ways of layering this data, presenting it in different ways next to each other, mixing it, juxtaposing it. So for quite a while we experimented, for instance, with a map view that would be replicated in all these different data layers. Um, or image sources and so on. Um, anyways, and in the end result, what we did was <laughs> one big layer cake, more or less, and Bo Broadway runs from south on the left-hand side to north on the right-hand side, and then we just present all these different data sources and image sources we have next to each other. And it really ranges from, well, handwritten annotations, Google Street View images, facade colors, taxi statistics, um, other social media statistics, income statistics. So we try to bring all these different layers that in our mind constitute the street, both the physical as well as the digital together, and make it explorable. Um, the piece itself is on display at the New York Public Library. There's a photography exhibition um, on 175 years of photography, and it's open for everybody. You can just go there. Yeah, oh yeah, and there's the team on the right hand side um, in front of the proud, the proud team in front of the piece. Um, uh, the, the final product is a touch installation with a wall print behind it. Uh, and I'll show you a, a screen capture in a minute, but you can also try it out online. We put the basically almost the same version as the installation online for you to play with. Um, and what it does is, in the beginning, it's like this super squeezed together accordion, like all the data we collect is basically on this one screen. So it's probably the most data dense screen I've ever uh, designed. And what you can do is, is zoom into individual parts. So you can just look into individual neighborhoods, say like, okay, this is Midtown. How does Midtown look like? What are the hotspots in Midtown? What's the overall picture of Midtown? And you can even zoom into street level, more or less, and see exactly like one block or one street corner, how does that play out data-wise, and how does it compare to, to the rest? So it's sort of this big accordion of data um, that we compiled and then make accessible. So here's a quick um, screen capture. So you can tap into any point in, in, in Broadway where you're interested in. It will zoom into this. Uh, you can zoom in further to actually see um, the building, see the images taken, um, investigate all the statistics. 
And the interesting thing is really the seamless aggregation. So you can go from street level straight back to 13 miles view, basically in one go, and choose any, any view in between. Yeah, and as I said, um, the project is accessible on the web, so you can uh, check out uh, the onbroadway.nyc URL and find all the documentation. I had to really abbreviate all the theoretical background and the design process. You will find that online and can even play with the application. And it's really 10,000 of images and 100,000 of data points that go into that one thing, um, which is interesting too, what we can do in the browser today. Um, next up. Uh, quite a popular issue, like a pop culture issue. Uh, we're still doing cultural analytics, and um, what we were interested in, yeah, when we started off collaborating, is really how, how photography is being used today, and one topic that came uh, to our attention was the just emerging trend of taking selfies. I know the topic is basically, you know, beaten to death right now, but that was like one and a half years ago, so keep that in mind. And um, we set out to investigate that, that phenomenon, because it's kind of interesting, it's something um, well, every, first of all, everybody takes selfies, like the, the president takes selfies, even at funerals. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Film stars take selfies, and, and of course there's lots of historical selfies as well, right? So the interesting thing is why is this such a topic that gets such attraction today, when in principle you, people have been doing it for 150 years, and, I mean, many people say it's the smartphones, but also we were interested, is it a new type of culture? Like, what's behind this? Is it just a fad? Is it a quick trend? Or is there something deeper behind it? So we set out to investigate that in a project called Selfie City. Again, a bigger team behind it, uh, even bigger than the Broadway team, of data scientists, um, social scientists. And so we had really tried to bring human sciences and, and, uh, and uh, data design and so on together in this project. Um, and what we did first is collect a lot of images from different cities and find out which of them were selfies. This is, of course, a longer process, and in our case involved a combination of using uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk um, tasks, so people actually judged if the image was a selfie and we collected a lot of these judgments, and automatic analysis. So we also took face detection algorithms First of all, to detect faces, but also to learn about individual features of the face, like where are the eye positions, are people smiling, do they wear glasses, can we make a guess about the gender of the person, things like this. So what we ended up with were 3,200 selfies from five cities. And you know, it fits on one screen, so it's not that big of a data set, obviously. So, um, then again, it's, it's a huge data set because in principle it's actually infinite, you know, because if you look at just a single image, you know, there's so many questions you can ask, there's so many things you could learn about the person, there's so many things you could look into. So each of these images is basically a world of its own. And I think that's very fascinating when you do this cultural analytics, the data is always as deep or as shallow as you want it to be, right? So we could talk in very broad strokes about these images and the people, or we could go into detail on each one of them. And this decision, like how far to zoom in and how to aggregate and how to talk about trends and patterns is very interesting, I think. Um, and it's challenging. So, for instance, if you use like just plain statistics, you know, naive statistics, let's say, to average all the images from one city, you know, you might hope to you get the average image of the city, but all you get is just a blur, right? It's just a an indistinguishable blur. But in a way, it's also maybe in a metaphor for what happens whenever you average, because you leave out all the interesting individual stuff, of course. You know, this is what, what averaging does. So in this case, I think if you have these really complex phenomena, that's, that approach sort of fails. And how we tackled that is more try to preserve the original material and all the graphs we produced. So, Here's a, a, a histogram representation of all the men and women taking selfies and horizontally sorted by the age. So you can see, this is Berlin, for instance, so you can see more women, and women tend to be younger, right? So it's sort of uh, insights you could draw from the graph. But because the, um, the graph is actually made up out of these individual photographs, we still retain this 
connection to the individual instance. You know, the, the individual instances or individual people taking the photos don't disappear in the statistics, but it's clear how they become part of that bigger whole. So that's one part or one way how we try to bridge this seemingly unbridgeable gap between the statistic and the individual, right? And on the website, you can find, you can explore all these graphs and actually also test a bit, does this make sense? Like, do these numbers that seem so scientific and objective, do they check out also in my perception? I think that's super important too, that people actually have a chance to judge like if what the scientist says uh, makes sense or not, uh, or matches their expectations or not. Uh, we took these even further in an interface where people could explore on their own. Um, the data set um, we gathered, so we had the self-exploratory, um, which was quite popular, and you could filter the data by different, like the poses people make, if they wear glasses, again, the genders, and so on. So here's all people tilting their head to the right. Um, and we learned, for instance, in Sao Paulo, people take more extreme poses. So um, um, they uh, like to tilt their heads. Um, uh, you can filter if people are more happy or uh, sad, things like this. And this is a way, on the one hand, to learn about the statistics of the data, but at the same time also not just work on the numbers level, but also always inspect these individual um, images that make up such a pattern. Yeah, and that's, that's quite fun to play with. I, I recommend to check that out. Um, then again, on the website, we also had very simple graphs. So I think about Selfie City, the overall package is quite interesting because we had theoretical essays, highly exploratory tools, but also very, very simple stats and findings that were readily picked up by the media. And last, a sort of an, um, an image collage, more or less, a film um, where we try to sort of make the complexity and the richness of the underlying image set uh, accessible and sort of rework it into, into this sort of very condensed selfie experience again without making that mistake of over-averaging and ending up in a gray blur. So what we did here is align all these images from one city at the eyes and uh, mouth positions so they would sort of form or you know, become these expressions of basically one face um, but rapidly swap through. And again, this is a way that doesn't make a, a numerical statement about selfies. It's more a way of how we can use our perception to explore and think about such a complex phenomenon and understand a bit like, yeah, who are these people taking selfies? How do they do that? And, and what can we learn from them? And what I find really interesting about these projects is, and what's so challenging about them, you never know what you're actually talking about. So are we talking about the people taking the selfies? Are we talking about Instagram? Are we talking about face recognition? Um, are we talking about Mechanical Turk or the demographics of Mechanical Turk? For instance, we had the age of the people estimated by Mechanical Turk workers. Um, so, but there might be a social bias there. So it turned out that a lot of the people in Bangkok, for instance, were estimated to be very young, but that could also be that to Europeans, Asian people look younger, right? All these things, all of these questions, all of that comes together in the project and you cannot isolate these parts anymore. But for all of these questions, I think these types of projects are really interesting starting points to think about these, these phenomena uh, uh, in new ways. Let me end with a quick general consideration of what this all is and what it all means. Um, and thinking about photography and data visualization led me sort of to think about portraits as well, because portraits are, I mean, this is one of the oldest art forms probably we have is to take images of ourselves or of other people. So um, this, for instance, is a sculpture that's 25,000 years old. I think it's brilliant in its abstraction, its expressiveness. Um, I mean, throughout the ages, the, the art of making portraits has always been about trying to capture something, the essence of a person, and uh, mostly through the face, but also the props that go around it, the general mood. Um, the most famous painting we have, obviously, is a, is a portrait. Uh, we have these artist renderings of themselves that's sort of uh, a, a selfie on its own. And I think what's interesting is in these portraits, it's always clear there's an interpretation of reality going on. So it's based on something physical, something observable. It should also look like the person, you know, so there should be some agreement on, okay, that's, that's a fair image of that person. But it's also clear there's an artist's rendition of reality, right? And we tend to think that sort of the big shift is that we now have tools to make objective images as opposed to an oil painting where you could paint anything. 
You know, you could think a photograph is like an objective image as opposed to a subjective oil painting. Obviously, that's not true because, as we all know, you know, the photo that makes it <laughs> on the title page, you know, is only one of a hundred or a thousand that has been taken. And it's just that the authorship is being shifted now to selecting the right view. You know, it's a more constrained situation. It's based on this sort of hard, physical, objective process of just pressing a button and the rest is just physics happening. But it's just as much an artist's impression of uh, Maggie Thatcher as the oil painting, in, in my view. And I think that's very similar to what we have in data visualization, like this framing. Uh, how do we put things into perspective? What's, what's the right way of showing a data set? I think there are many parallels with photography. Um, oh yeah, coming back to the Oscar selfie. So um, some of you have, might have seen the, the other side of the selfie is that Liza Minnelli tried to be in the same picture and she, she didn't make it. And I think that's something really to think about. Like, if you see one image, like, what's the backside, right? What happened behind the scenes that you don't see, right? What's been taken out, what's been left out, what's been taken away? And this is where authorship happens in many ways in data visualization and, and photography, obviously. Just a quick, quick note. Um, so a big discussion on the, on the selfie project is, so for all of these different categories, we actually had float numbers. So glasses was a value between 0 and 1, and 1 0.5 uh, means could have glasses or not, right? And so we turned that into a binary category, glasses yes, glasses no, with a small section of we don't actually know question mark category, right? And then we did the same thing for gender. And I think that's sort of, a, in a way, a different thing. We, we sort of did it for interface consistency, but if you think about what that means for the people in the middle to just label them with a question mark, it's strange. And, but it would also have been strange to give it an 0.4. So, you know, we were lacking a good interface, actually, for yeah, the things in between or that are not clearly male or female. And these are all political decisions that go into the design of data and data visualizations. Just to end this part about uh, portraits, there's a really interesting a whole practice around that. Uh, and the term was coined by Judith Donath uh, at MIT. And she looks a lot at, um, as Gemma has described, what is the data image we have of a person um, and how can we interpret sort of this, this, um, this activity of making a project. And now I'm concerned with how can we transfer that to these, all these complex um, cultural phenomena or these complex political phenomena that we have to deal with. What's the best um, artistic, but also, um, let's say, reality-based way of talking about these things? And I mean, the motivation is that obviously today's big issues cannot be photographed. So we, I think a big problem also of reporting is today that all the important stuff it's hard to put into a single picture. It's complex things. It's not things that happen at one place and a time in the world. These are big, complex issues. And I think as data visualization artists, we need to sort of provide these, these images maybe, right? Um, second really interesting question, maybe already segueing to the, to the panel, um, a portrait is something caring and loving and you know, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out a person. A profile that is something that is done automatically or on button press. Um, and where the sort of the artist takes themselves out of the equation and gives responsibility to a machine. Uh, then again, I think there's a fine line in between. Maybe these differences are not that clear cut. That's maybe something to discuss. And last, I think this is the point that connects all of us. I think if we learn how to deal better with data and uh, work with data, hopefully that leads to better data agency on our parts and being more, more active and not, not victims of data. Anyways, so I'll, I'll wrap it up and... Uh, Thanks.